right into the teaching. And this is session two in our end time, understanding the end times class. And the name of this session is debunking preterism. So you're probably like, what on earth does that mean? I'll explain it in a minute. But um, this is actually part one of the course that I've been teaching. Now, I, mentioned, I mentioned to you there's like four different, uh, four different parts of the course. And this is part one where we're looking at scoffers and doctrines of demons where we're talking about the importance of loving the truth and overcoming doctrines of demons that are being pushed here at the end of the age to lead to a great falling away. So go ahead and, and have, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 3. And as you're turning there, I'm going to just say, I just want to say a couple things here. Um, is I, I really feel like uh, I, I'm finally in a good mood today. Um, I feel like I've been so discouraged with the way our country is headed. I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but you just look at where our country's headed. I feel like I've been fighting off real discouragement. But I tell you what, football really helps. Um, it really, really, really helps. And... Uh, I'm going to ask my dear beloved friend, Quentin, with his Florida Gator shirt on, who, by the way, lost yesterday, and I take a little bit of pleasure in that, to kindly show some slides here. It's probably really difficult for him to show these slides. Very difficult. But how about this? If Florida beats Georgia, I, you buy me a Florida Gator shirt, and I will not wear it. So, um, no, I'll wear it. I will wear it if Florida beats Georgia. So, Anyway, so he's going to show a slide here, and I'm just going to say this. If you're watching online, you don't see the picture of what I'm talking about. Um, did he really show it? Oh, wow, that's awesome. Okay, I didn't know if he would or not. Okay, so anyway, if you're look, watching online, you don't see the picture. What it is, it's a picture of Kirby Smart, who is the Georgia football head coach, and he has to have a special assistant coach take his belt loop and hold him by the belt loop so he doesn't get too passionate and get a penalty. And so... I kind of feel that way with what I'm going to teach about today. I have a lot of passion about it. Um, and so anyway, I want you to be like that assistant. You're not going to reach and hold my belt loop, obviously. But if I start getting over too passionate, just take your hands and just kind of calm down, calm down. Okay, so I feel a lot of passion about what I'm talking about. And um, it's very important. It's very important what I'm going to be talking about. Debunking preterism. And you might be like, what in the world does that even mean? You're going to find out exactly what it means here in a minute. But anyway, so I just, I just want to say that. But let's, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And we looked at this, I think, last week as well. But Paul is writing, and he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the end of the age. And he says, let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come, talking about the day of the Lord, which is the last three and a half years of the age before Jesus comes back. The day of the Lord is not going to come, come until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And so the point of that is is there is coming before the Lord comes back. There's coming three and a half years at least, but I think it's already started. There's coming a great end time apostasy. That word apostasy in the Greek means a defection. It means a falling away. It means to turn from following Christ to following the Antichrist and his one world religion, ultimately, ultimately leading to the bowing down of the Antichrist himself. Now, what, what is, is interesting as well is Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 4.1, you, you can turn there, 1 Timothy 4.1, I'm just going to go ahead and go quickly though here, is the, the Spirit of God explicitly says that in the latter time, speaking of our time right now, that some are going to fall away from the faith. Now listen to how they're going to fall away from the faith. They are going to pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. See, in other words, what Paul is saying here, the reason there's going to be a great apostasy, the reason there's going to be a, a great falling away from the faith at the end of the age 
is because some are going to pay attention to doctrines of demons. In other words, there's going to be de demonically inspired teaching that is designed by hell to lead the masses of believers away from Christ to follow the Antichrist. Doctrines of demons. And so, what, you know, and I'm going to read one more scripture, 2 Timothy 4. Turn there, if you will. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Is, is Paul's writing again about the end of the age. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, and he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That is, the, that is the time we live in right now. The time we live in right now in the church is so many of the church is not enduring sound doctrine. They want their ears tickled. They want to go to church and feel good. They don't want the truth. And I, I mean, that's, that's why it, it's spreading all over this nation, all over, really all over the world, is I want to go to church and I want to feel good and I, and instead of receiving the truth. And Paul's saying they want their ears tickled. They're accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they're turning away from the truth and turning aside to miss. And we're seeing that happen right now. That's happening right now. Is there, they're, the, the, they're not wanting to endure sound doctrine. They want their ears tickled. We want to go to church. We want to feel good. You know, whether we don't really care if you give us the truth or not, they're not saying that. But you know, we want to go to church and feel good and not embracing the truth. And so, anyway, this teaching today, debunking preterism, what I'm really getting at, this I believe is a doctrine of demons designed by hell that is intended to lead the church and cause the church to fall away from the faith. And so in this session, I'm going to talk about debunking preterism. In the next session, I'm going to talk about debunking the seven mountain mandate. If you've never heard of that, you will. And so what, I just want to, one thing I want to say as I get started, if I mention any person's name, in, and I, I'm definitely going to mention names next week and some of the things that are being taught, if I mention anyone's name, I want you to know that I, I, I am not doing this with in, in any way with a spirit of criticism I am not a heresy hunter. I, I want to stay far, far away from the accuser of the brethren that is sowing discord in the body of Christ. I, I have no desire to go down that route. Now, really, it's, it's disgusting some of the way the heresy hunters just are just fueled by a critical spirit. I want to say that I am talking about doctrines I disagree with. I'm not attacking people. A lot of the people I'm going to talk about love the Lord with all their heart. They're doing great kingdom work. You know, there's a lot of great things they're doing. So I just want to make it real clear. I'm not in any way attacking a person when I mention their names. I just think it's very important. We've come to the time in the body of Christ where it's really, really important for people to know the teachers they're being influenced by and what they're teaching. You know, so I'm not doing it with a spirit of judgment or a criticism. I'm doing it with honor and love. And, and so... Anyway, I, but I think it's very, very important that we know the, some of the things very influential people are, see, are, are teaching and saying in the body of Christ today because a lot of people don't know. They, they really don't know. All they'll see is these, these marketing slogans that are put on their little websites or social media, and they'll, be, they'll give a hearty amen to it, but they won't really know underneath what is being, what is believed, the theology behind the marketing slogans, and they, they accepted hook, line, and sinker. And so, anyway, I think it's important to, to, you know, in their own words, let you know what they're teaching and to explain why I don't think that's biblical. But again, I want to do that with the utmost respect and honor that I can have. Uh, it's very important that we show honor in our disagreements with one another. We show honor and love when we are going to talk about things that are not biblical or whatever we don't think is biblical. So anyway, I want to, that's really my aim in approaching that. That's why I was showing you that Kirby Smart slide. That's my heart, but I know sometimes my passion can override my compassion, if I have any. And so that's why I want you to get me to calm down. So saying that. So let me just say this. I know when it comes to end times, and I know when it comes to big terms like preterism, 
a lot of times people will just completely zone out and they'll think, okay, that's not really important to me. Preterism, you know, okay, maybe you can use it over Thanksgiving dinner to sound like you're smart or whatever, but in all really at reality, we think, okay, it's not really relevant to me. And so therefore, when we kind of talk about these things, we zone out and we think that's not relevant, it's impractical or whatever. And so we just, you know, we don't really pay attention. I want to tell you, this is very important. What I'm going to talk about is very, very important. The rise of, the, of doctrines of demons have increased substantially over the last 10 to 15 years, substantially. And I mentioned that in one of the last sessions, that there has been an increase in doctrines of demons, substantial increase. And so it's very important that we understand what some people are teaching. So here's a possible scenario of, of how these, the seven mountain mandate and preterism could work together to lead to a great falling away from the faith. So uh, preterism, what that basically means is that, you, that people believe that some or all of the prophecies in Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled. The seven mountain ba mandate in combination with that believes that we need, the church needs to go and to conquer the seven mountains of culture which would include government and education, religion, family, media, finances, I think I've named them all. But so I want to show you how this could possibly work. Okay, so just get the picture. Let's just say that, you know, we're, we're in 2020 right now, but let's just say, and I believe this is very, very possible, that in the next 10 years, everything that could be in that needs to be in place for the Antichrist system to be established in the earth happens. So we got, we got a decade, basically. We got a decade for everything that the scriptures talk about to be in place before the Antichrist to come and for Jesus to return. So leading up to that, there is now a, a growing movement in the charismatic church, which there is, of preterism saying that a lot of the prophecies in Matthew 24 and a lot of the prophecies in, in most of the book of Revelation have already been fulfilled. Therefore, we don't really need to worry about the end time stuff. What's going to happen is a great revival is going to come, a great, a third great awakening. Now, I believe in a great revival and I believe in a third great awakening. I believe in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the, they believe that it's going to be used by the Lord to transform fundamentally the entire cultures of nations all around the world and that Jesus is going to come back with the, basically the entire world Christianized. And a lot of them don't believe that, the prop, that there's coming a literal Antichrist because they already believe it was fulfilled in 70 AD. They don't believe there's a harlot church. They don't believe there's a great apostasy. And so, you know, that with that in their heart, we want to see heaven come to earth. We want to see the kingdom of God come to the earth in fullness before Jesus comes back for the nations to be transformed. We've got to invade culture. We've got to take over the seven mountains of culture. And so just imagine now there all of a sudden the Pope comes onto the scene and there's this charismatic world leader who comes onto the scene with him. And these two, these two individuals can move in signs and wonders. Now that's a big deal because those in the revival movement are very attracted to signs and wonders. Now for the record, I totally am into signs and wonders. I believe that in signs and wonders. It's just not the, the full total message. But having, you know, believing in signs and wonders, believing in the miraculous, these two leaders, the Pope and the Antichrist, so they don't know it's the Antichrist because they think he's already was fulfilled in 70 AD, are confirming their message with signs and wonders. And they say, hey, guys, I see the great revival you're leading. I see the, the great move of God you're leading. Let's meet together and talk about how we can align and how we can come together to work together. We want to see the kingdom of God come to earth. We, you know, and, you know, God's, you know, we're being used to in miracles and signs and wonders. And so they go and they say, hey, you know, we need, to, we need to work together to see poverty end. We need to work together to see prosperity spread. We need to work together to provide health care to everyone in all the nations and provide or to take care of the environment and all these things. And these revival leaders who don't believe the prophecies have already been fulfilled make an alignment and a pact with the devil not even knowing it. You see what I'm saying? Very important. It's not something impractical for seminaries or theologians to talk about over coffee. This is real life stuff that is unfolding right before our eyes. We've got to know 
whether or not this is true. Because I'm telling you, this doctrine is spreading. This doctrine is really multiplying fast in the charismatic church. I mean, I would say that 50% of the charismatic Pentecostal revival church now has been heavily influenced by preterism and the Seven Mountain Mandate. It could, you know, some people would say 80%, 70, 80% more. Um, It's spreading all over the place. And so we really need to examine it in Scripture. And so we're going to be doing that over the next two sessions. And so when we get into the end times, it's very important to understand, I want to list for you four different views of the end times. There's four different views of the end times, four main views of the end times. In other words, anyone that is going to study the end times is going to have usually one of these four views. Now, when I say that, that that doesn't mean that everyone in those different categories believe exactly the same way. I mean, there's, I don't want to paint it with this broad stroke to say everyone believes just like this. There's nuances in all the different categories. But the first one is the one I've already mentioned is preterism. Now, preterism is, comes from the Latin word that means past. And what preterism means, and I've I mentioned, I'm going to say it again, Preterism means that all or most of the prophecies in Matthew 24, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, were fulfilled in 70 A.D. when the Roman army came and attacked Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, and drove the Jewish people out of their homeland for over 1,800 years. And so they take Matthew 24, they take the book of Revelation, and they say these prophecies have already been fulfilled in the past. That's why we get preterism. Now, we, get, we, we have two different, term, two different categories within preterism. There's full preterism, which I believe is an outright heresy. Full preterism says everything has already happened. The resurrection of the dead has already happened. The marriage supper of the Lamb has already happened. Uh, the, the new heavens and the new earth have already come down from heaven. I'm like, okay, where, are, where is it? I don't see it. I mean, it's just, that's, that's total heresy. I'm not even going to spend any time talking about that. But partial preterism I think is, is something we really need to look at because many influential leaders, and a lot of them I really respect, a lot of them I have a lot of respect for, are, believe, are beginning to or, or, or believe in partial preterism, meaning that some of the, the prophecies in Matthew 24 have been fulfilled, some in the book of Revelation have been fulfilled, but not all have been fulfilled. Okay, so that's, that's a partial and full preterism. Now, the... Uh, The ones I'm going to mention here, just to give you an idea of who's teaching partial preterism, uh, some partial preterists that are well known are Bill Johnson and Chris Vallotton of Bethel and Redding, California, Uh, the late Peter Wagner, who spearheaded the New Apostolic Reformation, he was a a partial preterist, and then scholars Sam Storms, who I I have a lot of respect for, N.T. Wright, Hank Hanegraaff, R.C. Sproul. These are some of the teachers that are teaching partial preterism. So the second thing, the second view I want to talk about is post-millennialism. And again, these are big words. Don't zone out on the big words. Post-millennialism. This view believes Jesus Christ is going to return after the church has Christianized the entire world. And I mentioned that earlier. The seven mountain mandate that I mentioned, some who believe and teach the Seven Mountain Mandate are not post-millennialist. They're pre-millennialist. You said it too fast, you'll start speaking in tongues. But they're, they're post-millennialist and there's pre-millennialist. So anyway, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But anyway, the, the idea is that the church is going to invade the culture and they're going to conquer the seven mountains of culture, religion, education, government, finance, media, arts and entertainment. You know, I, I, I think there's one more, but anyway. Um, that's the idea, is, is, is before Jesus comes back, the entire world is going to, for the most part, is going to be Christianized. It's a golden age of Christianity where prosperity is flowing, miracles and signs and wonders are flowing, a great awakening has come, a great revival has come. And most of the nations have been transformed, uh, not just individuals, but nations, cultures have been transformed. And so 
That's the idea of post-millennialism, is they believe that the church is going to win the nations before Jesus comes back, and that we're actually living in right now, the millennium. Revelation 20, verse 6 says that Jesus Christ is going to come to the earth and reign for a thousand years. And so post-millennialists believe that's being accomplished through the church. Now, some post-millennialists that you'll, uh, um, just, just to say this, Post-millennialists are often partial preterists. That makes sense? You're like looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Some well-known post-millennialists are, again, Bill Johnson, Chris Vallotton of Bethel, Peter Wagner uh, as well. Now, in, in the 1800s, most evangelicals were post-millennialists. Jonathan Edwards, who led the First Great Awakening, was a post-millennialist. George Whitfield, who was a part of the First Great Awakening, was a post-millennialist. Matthew Henry, who wrote so many commentaries, is a post-millennialist. So, you know, there, there's been a lot of great men of God in, in recent and current and past history that were post-millennialist. So, just because, you know, people believe that doesn't mean that they're, everything else they did is wrong. And so, sometimes people talk, hear this and say they hear the names of someone... They teach them, oh, I'm never ever going to listen to what they say. No, don't. That's a lot. That's really immature. <laughs> Just because this one area is wrong doesn't mean everything else they say is wrong. I mean, Jonathan Edwards is one of the greatest theologians in history. I mean, I think he was wrong about postmillennialism, but it doesn't mean everything else he said was wrong. So don't go off the deep end and say, okay, because they teach this, this, and this, or whatever about the end times, therefore everything else they say is wrong. No, just examine everything they teach in Scripture. And if something's not accurate here, it doesn't mean everything else they say is inaccurate. The third one is amillennialism. Okay, and so you've got the word A, you've got the, the letter A, A. A indicates that they don't, and this is really similar to postmillennialism, they interpret the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth spiritually rather than literally and it's so, the main difference between post-millennialism and amillennialism, I'll be glad when I move past this because it's causing me to speak in tongues, is post-millennialists are very optimistic in terms of we believe God is going to release a great revival that's going to transform the nations, whereas amillennialists believe more pessimistically. They don't believe a great revival is coming. They just believe we're living in the millennial kingdom right now. Some millennial, millennialists believe that Satan has been bound for a thousand years. Others look at that and say, like Sam Storms, he says that Satan has only been bound from launch, launching Armageddon prematurely. So there's a lot of variance in those different things. Okay, so let, let me show you a couple slides here to summarize what we're talking about. The first slide is the, the first slide is the uh, the, the difference between or, or, or showing. Let's see here. The first slide is actually I can't see the first slide. What is the first slide? Huh? Iceberg. Not the iceberg. Let's do that in a minute. Uh, show the slide of um, the difference between. Post-millennialist and amillennialist. There should be a title there. Okay, good. Okay, so if you notice here that it, the slide that is showing here, uh, it should show, it's, you, you can see that um, Jesus has ascended and now we're living in the church age, but we're also living in the millennial kingdom and that millennial kingdom is now going to happen until Jesus comes back and bring us into the eternal state. That's what post-millennialists and amillennialists believe pretty much. The main difference, and show the slide of the main difference between the two, the main difference between the two, post-millennialist is very optimistic, a great revival is gonna transform the nations, whereas amillennialists believe not so optimistically. So those are the two difference between, between the two of them. Okay, so, that said, let's look at number four, um, premillennialism. Premillennialism believes that, and, and you can show the slide there, premillennialism believes that we're living in the church age 
And ever since the ascension of Jesus, we're living in the church age, and we're living in that church age until the time Jesus returns. And then when Jesus returns, then there's going to be a 1,000-year reign of Christ. That is what this class believes. That's what we believe. Um, a lot of some premillennial or some premillennialist are Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins who wrote Left Behind. All the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary believe this. Mike Bickle of IHOP is a, believes this. Dr. Michael Brown, most Baptist churches. But this is the approach we're taking in this class is this is what we believe. This is way, and I'm going to you know, hopefully unfold it as we get into this. But that's, that's all of those big, long words. I'm very glad because, man, they're hard to pronounce sometimes. Now let's talk about this. Five reasons partial preterism is unbiblical. Five reasons partial preterism is unbiblical. So as you, as you listen to this, here's a couple things I want to say. Is Number one is I showed you the reason why this is very relevant to the times we live in. This is very relevant for you to pay attention to and say, okay, I need to understand this. But another reason I haven't mentioned is, is you're being trained as a messenger. If you're in our forerunner school, even if you're not, even if you're in our church and not part of it, you're being trained up as a messenger. This doctrine of demons is on the rise. I'm telling you that right now. This doctrine of demons is on the rise, and you need to be able to defend it. You need to be able to understand why it's unbiblical. So listen, you, you're, I mean, most, most of you who are going to listen to this probably don't believe in preterism, partial or full, but you're going to come into contact with people who do believe that, and they're going to say, okay, they're going to give you their arguments. They're going to say this, this, and that. You need to be able to say, well, no, well, here's the reason why this is unbiblical. So that's why you need to pay attention. So we'll show the slide now of the iceberg. The other reason I think is very, very important is, you know, last session I mentioned some things Chris Vallotton said, his eight es es eschatology, his eight end-time views. And so... In those views, you listen to them, and they, a lot of them sound so great. God is good. God, you know, I believe God's good. God is good. God's not going to show, release judgments in the last days. The days are going to get better, not worse. And, you know, all that sounds good. Then the nations are going to be transformed by a great revival. So if you think about it in terms of an iceberg, you've got, you know, you see from the, from the ocean, you see the very tip of the iceberg. You see the different, you know, you see just only the tip of the iceberg. You see the, the little things they say, and they all sound so great, and so much of the church says, amen, we believe it, amen, hallelujah, praise God, he's good, he's doing these great things. But underneath the ocean waters is this massive mountain of ice in which preterism and postmillennialism is driving the doctrines, and so all you're seeing is the conclusions they've reached, but you don't understand the theology that undergirds it. That makes sense? And so I, I'm seeing this all over the place in social media, all over the place, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, uh, Instagram, whatever, YouTube, is so many Christians don't have a clue what they're being taught. They're just seeing the marketing slogans. They're just seeing the tweets, these short little sentences, and they're saying, amen, praise God. But they don't understand what's driving that is the theology that we're going to address, preterism. And so that's why I think you know, we're uh, specifically partial preterism because full preterism is not worth my, even, a, uh, uh, even any time to talk about. Okay, five reasons why partial preterism is unbiblical. Number one is there is overwhelming evidence the book of Revelation was written near 75 AD. And you're like, well, what, what does that matter? This is why it matters because... If we can prove that the book of Revelation was written when most, scholars, most conservative scholars believe it was written near 95 AD, then that entire view of preterism, partial and full, crumbles like a house of cards. So let me just talk about that for a second and tell you why. Because see, when partial preterists say all the prophecies were fulfilled before 70 AD, if we say, well, the book of Revelation was actually written 25 years later, your argument completely crumbles. And there's incredible, most, you know, most people, if they're looking at it without bias, would say, yes, the book of Revelation was written near 95 AD. That's what most conservative scholars believe the book of Revelation was written. And so we're going to look at this and, and, and just explain it real quick. But Irenaeus, 
Irenaeus, who was a bishop who lived in AD 120 to 2000 or AD 120 to 202, he was discipled by Polycarp. Do you know who discipled Polycarp? John, the Apostle John. The one who wrote the book of Revelation discipled Polycarp. Polycarp discipled Arrhenius. And Arrhenius, listen to what he says here in his book. He says, We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of Antichrist, for, it, for if, it, if it were necessary that his name should be distinctively revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him, the Apostle John, who held this vision. For that was seen not very long time since, but almost in our day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. In other words, Domitian was a Roman emperor who reigned in, you know, towards the late first century, about 90, 95 AD or whatever. And so, in other words, Arrhenius is telling us, and he would know more than anyone because he was discipled by Polycarp, he would know more than anyone, okay, he would know when the book of Revelation was written. That quote tells us very, with, with very much certainty that the book of Revelation has a late date. Other church fathers, I've got it in the notes, uh, claim the very same thing. And so, I, I mean, if, even Sam Storms, who is a partial preterist, even Sam Storms uh, agrees that the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD. So that takes that argument, a lot of the argument that undergirds that argument and says, okay, there's no way this can stand. There's no way that partial preterism can stand. Okay? Make sense? You still there? I'm not boring you too much. Okay? You're there? Okay, number two is the abomination of desolation was not fulfilled in 70 A.D. Very, very important point. The abomination of desolation was not fulfilled in 70 A.D. Let's turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15 Jesus in the Olivet Discourse is talking about the end of the age, and I believe, again, this has not yet been fulfilled. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, listen to what Matthew says, let the reader understand. There is an apostolic command by Matthew to tell the reader, understand what uh, Daniel wrote in his prophecies. Understand the book of, Reve understand the book of Daniel. Now, I want you, you, you know, with your finger in verse 15, move down now to verse 21. He says, for then there will be a great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. In other words, let me just explain this. In other words, when you see the abomination of desolation, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. In other words, you can't just say, well, this, the, the abomination of desolation means something that's not disconnected from the book of Daniel. You cannot do that because Jesus is quoting directly from the book of Daniel. Jesus is telling us when you see the abomination of desolation, then there's coming a great tribulation. You see the connection. The abomination of desolation, then a great tribulation. So the question is this, was that fulfilled when the Roman army under, under Titus came in to Jerusalem and ransacked the temple, burned the temple to the ground in, in, in AD 70, then you know, waged war against the Jews from 66 AD to 135 AD, completely conquered the Holy Land of Israel, drove them out of their land for over 1,800 years, was that fulfilled in 70 A.D.? Did that fulfill the abomination of desolation which Daniel spoke of? Now I'm going to say the answer is clearly, absolutely no. Partial preterists will say, they'll say, no, when, when the Roman army came and attacked Jerusalem, that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I want to say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Here's why. Look, to, to understand 
why we've got to go back to the book of Daniel. So let's go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Daniel 11:31, which if you, if you look in any Bible software for the abomination of desolation, the first reference you're going to find is Daniel 11:31. Daniel 11:31. Daniel 11.31 says, Forces from him will arise and desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. Some scholars believe that was fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, who conquered Israel in about 170, or what was that, uh, 170 to 165, 175 to 164 B.C., Others will say, no, that's clearly, clearly the Antichrist. My view on that is, if you look at the context after verse 31, it, it clearly is the Antichrist. I believe that's the Antichrist. But that could be debated by scholars. The, the next reference in Daniel 12.11, I want you to turn over to Daniel 12.11. Daniel 12.11, to me, is clearly... Uh, you can you cannot debate this, in my opinion. This is clearly in the context. If you read the whole chapter of Daniel chapter 12, there's the resurrection of the dead. There's Israel's great trouble. There's there is God delivers Israel out of great trouble. It's clearly connected. It's clearly the end times. This is not Antiochus Epiphanes. This is clearly the end of the age. And Daniel, or the, the angel says to Daniel, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. That's clearly talking about the Antichrist and the end of the age. It has not been fulfilled. So, and, and notice also that 1,290 days is a three and a half year period. It's a three and a half year period. That, that equates to 30 days. You use 30 days in the Jewish calendar to bring about three and a half years. So for three and a half years in the holy place, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said it's going to be set up in the holy place, not the holy city. It's set up in the holy place in the Jewish temple for three and a half years. Then the great tribulation would start. So the question is, did that happen when the Romans attacked Jerusalem in 70 AD? And the answer is clearly no. The abomination of desolation is an idol of some sort in the Jewish temple. Whether an emperor, whether a lord, whether a person or some kind of an idol, it is, an, it is idol worship in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish temple that defiles the temple and leads to desolation. When Rome attacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, they did not set up an idol and they did not put in an emperor to be worshipped. They, they immediately, what happened was the, the Roman army saw the temple and they knew there was a lot of gold in this temple. They were, they were hungry for money and gold and they, they also had incredible hate for the Jews and so when they were coming into Jerusalem, they said, we're going to, even the, uh, the, the commander said, don't touch the temple. But the army gained so much momentum and took the temple by force and burned it, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24, stone by stone to the ground. It was completely decimated. There were, in other words, there was no idol that was set up in the holy place of the Jerusalem temple for three and a half years. Clearly, that prophecy was not fulfilled in 70 A.D., it makes sense. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. I, I did not see how someone could read the book of Daniel, understand the abomination of desolation and what it meant. So we got to understand, it's got to mean not what we think today. It's got to mean what Daniel thought it meant in his day. Daniel would have understood clearly being a, a Jewish Hebrew uh, man of God, he would have clearly understood that meant for some kind of an idol to be placed into the center of the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple. And so that clearly did not happen when Rome invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD. Number three, the third reason I don't believe uh, partial preterism is biblical is the Roman desolation of Israel does not meet the criteria for the greatest tribulation in world history. 
Partial preterists will say, well, when they attacked the temple and burned it to the ground, when they attacked the temple and burned it to the ground, the great tribulation was then the attack of the Romans upon the Jews that followed from 70 A.D. all the way to 135 A.D., driving the Jews out of the Holy Land for over 1,800 years. And they'll say, well, well when that happened, when they, when they attacked the temple like that, and they then attacked Israel, that, that fulfilled the Great Tribulation where over one million Jews were killed by the Roman army. If you read history, I mean, it's pretty graphic. It's pretty terrible. You, you, you read of like crucifixions. You read of starvations, cold-blooded murder. You read of all these different things taking place. And anyway, so uh, the, the partial preterists will look at that and say, okay, that was what this meant. In other words, when they destroyed the temple, then the war that followed after that the war that followed after that was the Great Tribulation. But I want to say, if you look at the context, if you look at the Scripture, it's clearly a Great Tribulation that has not occurred. Listen, listen to what it says in verse 21. It has not occurred since the beginning of the world, nor will it, nor has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. In other words, there's nothing like the Great Tribulation that follows the abomination of desolation. So partial preterists have to prove that what happened in Israel between 66 AD to 135 AD, they have to prove that was the greatest time, not only in Israel's history, the greatest tribulation in Israel's history, but they have to prove that it's the greatest time in world history. Because look at what Jesus said here. He said, it is... A great tribulation that has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. You see that? It's, to me, it's pretty clear. It's pretty, pretty clear that it, it just, just take, for example, what happened. Just take, what, for example, what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust. Where Hitler killed six million Jews in the Holocaust. You know, as tragic as it was that what happened by the Romans, the Holocaust was far worse than that. Far worse than that. Just imagine the, the amount of lives lost between 1914 to 1945. Over 150 million people died in World War I and the Spanish flu, World War II. Nothing during that, that 31 year time span, nothing compared to that ever in the, in the history of the world, it certainly eclipsed what happened between 66 AD and 135 AD. In other words, what we know from that is that this prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. The great tribulation that's coming is, has not happened in the past. It is coming in the future. You cannot say, in my opinion, that what happened in 70 AD fulfills uh, what Jesus described here in Matthew chapter 24. Way more, way more loss of life, way more tribulation, even in 1914 to 1945. Number four is the abomination of desolation is connected to the resurrection from the dead and Israel's deliverance. Notice back, let's go back and you should be in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, if you look at it in, in verses two through three, you see that it's clearly connected to the resurrection of the dead. You see it's also connected to the greatest time in Israel's history, greatest time of testing in Israel's history. We know that the, what happened during the Holocaust was greater than what happened in, in 70 AD. And we also know that Israel's deliverance from trouble, God has promised de Israel's deliverance from trouble. God never delivered Israel from trouble in 70 AD. God did not deliver Israel from trouble in 70 AD. That's coming, but he did not do it in 70 AD. And so we got to ask the questions. Were the dead raised after Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD? No. Was this the worst suffering in Israel's history? No. Six million Jews died in the Holocaust. You know, so truly, did, did God deliver Israel from the Romans? Clearly no. In other words, this prophecy that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 was not fulfilled in 70 AD. Number five, Preterism relies too heavily on allegorical interpretations. Here's the thing is this. When we understand prophecy, prophecy, just here's how we need to understand prophecy. Is prophecy, if you look at it in history, prophecy was uh, spoken literally 
and fulfilled literally. Now, I know there's some times when there's allegory, but the default method of interpreting prophecy should always be literal unless the context suggests otherwise. For example, Isaiah 7:14. Isaiah said a virgin would be with child. And it, we would name this child God with us. Well, that was, not, that was a literal, there was nothing allegorical or spiritualized about that. That was clearly a literal prophecy that was fulfilled literally by Jesus Christ. Another example, Micah 5.2 is a leader is going to rise up out of Bethlehem and his days will be from the days of eternity. Again, a literal prophecy fulfilled literally by the God-man Jesus Christ when he came onto the scene. Isaiah, another example, Isaiah uh, 53 talks about that, G, that the Messiah would be with a rich man in his death. That was fulfilled when Jesus was buried with the rich man. So, in other words, the default, based on the precedent that has been set, that prophecy is literal unless the context suggests otherwise. Prophecy is literal unless the context suggests otherwise. Because we've already seen in history that literal prophecy literally fulfilled, therefore when we read it, uh, future prophecies, we've got to interpret it literally. That is the default method of interpretation. Uh, of course, unless the context suggests otherwise, but most of the time, almost every time, the context does tell us when it's not a literal prophecy. When Daniel saw the ram and the goat, the angel told him, the ram is Media Persia and the goat is Greece. When John saw the harlot in Revelation 17 and 18, the, the angel told him, the city that you saw is the great woman that, who reigns over the kings of the earth. In other words, the, great, the woman you saw is Rome. And, so, and when, when John saw seven stars and seven lampstands, the angel told, or Jesus told John, the seven stars are seven angels, the seven lampstands are seven churches. In other words, if there's anything or ever any time allegorical or spiritual, the context usually tells us that these things should be interpreted allegorically. So the problem with preterism is, you know, you can look at, you can look at the argument of, of the, the, the abomination of desolation, thinking, okay, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty good argument at first glance. It's a pretty good argument. You read some of their, their books and their, their teachings and stuff like that, and you go, I'll give you that. that. That's a good argument. I don't agree with it, but it's a good argument. But when you come to some of the stuff, when they get further down in Matthew 24, and especially in the book of Revelation, it gets really crazy. I'm going to share a couple examples with you. Because when you start going down the, the, the route of allegorical or over-spiritual interpretations, you can basically make the Bible say anything you wanted to say. So, let me just give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. See, we don't have the luxury of twisting scriptures to make it say what we want it to say. Peter said that the scriptures are not a matter of one's own interpretation. We cannot just say, we want the scriptures to say this or that. We, in other words, we got to make sure we're really understanding the context and what the author intended. And if there is context clues to say, this is what this means. For example, partial preterists will take Matthew 24, verse 29, where it says, After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When I read that, as the default method being a literal interpretation, I think, and I think this is the right way, the literal meaning of that is the, the sun is literally going to be darkened. The moon is literally not going to give its light. The stars are literally going to fall from the sky. I mean, there's no reason for me to try to allegor, allegor allegorize that or spiritualize that. The default method is literal, therefore that should be the literal meaning in, in my opinion of, of the way that goes. But here's how a partial preterist takes that to explain how it was fulfilled in 70 AD. He says, to see this fulfillment, we need to be familiar with, with certain Jewish idioms. The sun, the moon, the stars frequently were used to refer to governing authorities. And he talks about even in our day, we got uh, modern times, we use the word star to symbolically, such as when we refer to a movie star, a sports star, a superstar. 
In biblical terminology, the fame and glory of large cities were said to shine as the sun, moon, or stars. And, and so he goes on to say, his conclusion is, basically Jesus was using language to declare destruction. That's what he said. That's what you have to say. That's what you, you have to do that kind of twisting of Scripture to make Matthew 24 fit into a 70 A.D. context. And when you do that, it just becomes crazy. It just becomes crazy. And so it, it just becomes, the Scriptures then become anything you want them to say. Another example is when they get into the book of Revelation, they take the two witnesses in the book of Revelation and they spiritualize and allegorize them. Now listen to what, listen to what he says. This is one of the, the same author, uh, Partial Preterist, says about the two witnesses. I read that literally and I say, before the Lord comes back, God is going to literally send two witnesses to Jerusalem. They are going to prophesy for three and a half years. I believe it's going to be Elijah and Moses. And they are literally going to prophesy for three and a half years in Jerusalem. Now, here's how a partial preterist reads this. He says, in what way were the law and the prophets put to death? Because the two witnesses are put to death by the Antichrist. He says, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army, it appeared that everything in which the Jews had put their trust in had failed. So also the Jews were no longer God's mouthpiece to reveal his will to the world. But after three and a half days, the voice of the law and the prophets rose again. The two witnesses were called back to heaven. In other words, this is what he's saying. They spiritualize the interpretation and they say it's not two literal witnesses coming. They say when, when, when Rome invaded Jerusalem and attacked Jerusalem, they killed the law and the prophets and then, three and a half days later, God, it looked like the law and the prophets were dead, but God somehow supernaturally resurrected them. Okay, that's just nonsense. That's just crazy, crazy of interpretation. I mean, if you go down this path of partial preterism and, and you really look at it, it just becomes really crazy. I mean, it just, it becomes, it, it just makes absolutely no sense. In fact, that's one of the reasons why so many people don't like the book of Revelation is they look at it and they're like, I have no idea what it means. I have no idea what this means. It's, it's confusing. Well, the reason it's confusing is so many people have over-spiritualized it and complicated it. In fact, the book of Revelation, you know, yes, there's some hard things to understand, but the book of Revelation is actually pretty easy to understand when you, under, uh, when you realize a few different things. A lot of people hate the book of Revelation because they look at it and they're like, what is this even talking about? Because all these over-spiritualized interpretations. Okay, one more. Again, learn these. Okay, learn these because you need to defend this position. I'm telling you, this, the rise of this doctrine of demons is going to increase. And messengers need to learn how to defend these. We need to pluck people out of the fire. And the charismatic movement, I'm telling you, in the days to come, God is going to release a great revival, but mixed into that revival is this, these false end-time teachings, and many are going to begin to believe this stuff. We need messengers to explain to them why this is an error. I'm telling you, don't zone out. Just keep, keep focused. Number six, Jesus has not yet cast the beast into the lake of fire. Let's look at Revelation 19. Verse 19 through 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and thrown alive into the lake of fire. Notice what happens. Jesus returns. Jesus returns. And the beast is thrown alive into the lake of fire. The beast in the book of Revelation must be interpreted the same way throughout the entire book of Revelation. In other words, you can't say, partial preterists will say, the beast in Revelation was Caesar Nero, Caesar Nero, and then to say, okay, well, then you come to this scripture when Jesus comes back and he's thrown alive into the lake of fire. Well, Nero was not thrown alive into the lake of fire. You can't change the beast 
in Revelation 13 to mean Nero, and then make the beast in Revelation 19 mean some empire, evil empire at the end of the age. Whatever the beast is in the book of Revelation has to be the beast throughout the entire book of Revelation. So, you know, Nero committed suicide in 68 AD. He was not thrown alive into the lake of fire. So we know Jesus has not yet cast the beast into the lake of fire. So, I mean, I could list, so, those are just six, six examples. I mean, I could, li I could probably write an entire book about that. I'm not going to, but there are so many arguments. I mean, really, the partial preterist argument is, you know, there's a few good arguments, but for the most part, it is, when, it, when you really come down to it, it's, it's really unbiblical. It's untenable. You can, uh, to me, the scriptures refute it clearly, clearly, clearly. In other words, we can safely say Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation have not been fulfilled yet. They are going to await a future time, and I believe we're getting closer and closer to that time when they are going to be fulfilled. And so, as we bring this message to a close, partial preterism, even though great people believe in it, that love the Lord and are doing great work, partial preterism as a doctrine, I believe, is a doctrine of demons designed by hell to lead to a great apostasy at the end of the age. Because if you believe prophecy has already been fulfilled, you will not be, have the discernment to recognize the Antichrist, the false prophet, the harlot church that's rising up. And so anyway, I want to encourage you to go into these notes and read these notes for yourselves. We'll, if you're in our church, we'll email them to you. But read them for yourselves. Learn these things. It's very important because you're going to meet people. You're going to meet, I, I believe it's going to increase in the days ahead. You're going to meet people who believe this and you need to gently explain to them. You've got to be equipped to explain to them why this is not scriptural. So in the next session, uh, we're going to talk about the seven mountain mandate and why I believe that's not scriptural as well. So anyway, we'll end there. We'll just, uh, we'll end the...